Hello there, guys. Today we're taking a look at an RPG that goes by the name of Cyrilum, I believe is how you pronounce it. Cyrilum? Cyrilum? Cyrilum. It is a fairly unique, uh, almost JRPG-esque sort of classic style RPG, and it has some very unique mechanics to it. It's actually a pretty unique game all the way around, so I guess to start off, let's just talk about what you're seeing right now. Uh, the game has a rather striking graphic style that is, of course, in the, you know, retro style, but it has actually done quite well. It reminds me a lot of the, uh, the 16-bit era Final Fantasies and other things like, uh, uh, what's it called? Dragon Warrior? The enemy sprites, the creature sprites particularly, are pretty impressive to me because they actually look very similar to the, the color palette and detail level that you would see in a 16-bit Final Fantasy or, or kind of game of that era. It's kind of cool. I I approve. There are lots and lots of creatures in this game. So I guess to start off with, what is it? Well, it is an RPG where you are tasked with kind of making your own story. Uh, it doesn't really have much of a story of its own, which is both good and bad, and I'll get onto that later. But... Basically, you are a king or queen, you make your character, you are a mage, uh, that's me in the robe there, I'm beautiful, and you summon up an army of creatures to fight for you and attempt to gain more power and rule your kingdom. Now, this is actually your castle, you own this castle, and this is the hub area where you'll go back to uh, time after time to do things in the game, and you will be unlocking more characters in it and uh, more rooms for it as you go, and that's another thing of course have to explain but to start off with uh, and gameplay wise let's just go to a place so this is the war room and there will be a teleporter in here this lovely looking stone that will take you to a realm and this is where the meat of the gameplay lies a realm is really just kind of a randomly generated themed level and uh, the levels have various characteristics and there are different ones depending on different things so if I teleport to one right now it is a dungeon realm. So in every realm, you'll be given a duty, which is basically a quest. Complete the quest, and you will get a lot of experience for yourself and your creatures, as well as some extra rewards, and something called a royalty point. So this game has a lot of mechanics. It starts out fairly simple, but the longer you go and the more things are added onto it, the more you start to realize that there's actually quite a lot to it. It's kind of mechanics layered onto each other to create something much different than the sum of their parts. So every realm has a theme. There's dungeon, nature, life, death, chaos, uh, da -da 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 -da, sorcery, I think a few others, and they each have their own unique attributes. Uh, both in the monsters that inhabit them and the objects you'll be able to interact with and the clutter that you'll find. So, we're gonna get into a battle right now because I'm being chased by a bunch of creatures, so here we go. Battle! This is the battle system, and this is where the kind of JRPG aspect comes in. It is a very old-school, front-facing style, turn-based RPG. So, battle system is fairly simple, but again, uh, involves a lot of mechanics layered onto each other that makes it more complex. So you can see my six creatures down at the bottom and their six creatures up at the top. And of course to the right of the screen is the action cue which shows w who goes when. So right now it's my Bloodhound's turn. And uh, every creature has an attack. You can of course defend and you can provoke. Now provoking actually makes it more likely that they'll attack that creature but Unless it, something special says otherwise, the creature suffers a defense penalty while it is provoking, so it'll take more damage. You can also cast spells. You have a spell book here. And uh, again, these are all many things I'll have to kind of explain as the video goes on. It's actually fairly complex when it gets down to how many mechanics there are. These normally take the turn of the creature that it is when you cast them, but as you can see, a couple of them do not. These are technically your mage actually casting these spells. There are lots and lots and lots of them. I think about a hundred of them, actually. You can also do something called extracting, which uh, gives you a chance, depending on how low the health of the creature is, to actually extract a core from that creature. And that is down to the main kind of idea of this game is to build your army of creatures. And doing so involves extracting three cores from any given creature out in the field to 
create one of your own that you can level up and equip and, and modify on your own. So it's, I guess, kind of Pokemon-esque. It's actually more uh, Megami Tensei-esque, the old school Megami Tensei games and some of the newer Shin Megami Tensei, like Nocturne and things like that. So I'm going to attack. Now, as you can see, every creature has a class, it's called. This is life, this is sorcery, this is nature, this is chaos. And uh, those are kind of like elements, actually, but the best way to look at them is actually as colors of mana in Magic the Gathering, as weird as that sounds. That's kind of how they interact. So right now, my Bloodhound is a death class creature, and death class creatures are generally strong against chaos class creatures. So I want to attack this thing with him. And I definitely want this thing to be out of the picture anyway, because it's pretty strong. So it's going to attack, do a bunch of damage. And uh, it has a status effect called Dire Wolves. There's an interesting bit of... S there's a lot of buffs and debuffs in this game, and several of them are actually kind of like summoned creatures or beings that attack with your creature. So in this case, the Bloodhound, his uh, special ability is that he summons Dire Wolves. So they attack for 15% of his damage, and then he also summons another pack in the control of one of my other creatures after he attacks. So. You're starting to see how the complexity of the battle system comes in here, I think. Also, because of my siren down there in the bottom right, all of my creatures have a barrier, which is like a shield that takes damage before their health gauges do, so that makes my party a bit easier to, uh, to kind of tank some upfront damage at first. Now my smith, he is absurdly strong, so I want to use him to... I can pretty much one-shot any of these creatures with him. Uh, so I'm going to attack what I feel is one of the more threatening ones, which is this guy. Because his ability is, whenever he's attacked, there's a small chance that he'll reduce the, uh, the damage of whatever attacked- or the health of whatever attacked him to one. So I want to attack him as few times as possible to reduce that chance, so I'm gonna hit him. Bam! Crap ton of damage. And he's dead. Let's see, the Servant Hunter is an awesome creature because it throws a glaive that bounces across three different creatures. So I'm going to see if I can kill this slime with it. It's going to bounce around. And that slime is dead. Sweet. Now they get to attack. Ow. Barely any damage, luckily, because I had that barrier. Alright. My angel... Uh, there's no death creatures here, which he's best against. So we're just going to kind of attack. Try and kill some of these things. Ow. Alright, the Lich Priest, he's pretty cool. He's actually the one I started with. Uh, when you first start, you are given a, a choice between the type of mage you want to be, and that determines a couple of things, including the creature you start with. I chose Death Mage, so I any of the death spells I cast are more powerful than any of the others. And I started with a Lich. A Lich Priest. He sacrifices some of his health every time he attacks to up the damage he does. So that's nice. Alright, my Siren Oracle is definitely my physically weakest creature. It doesn't do much damage most of the time, but it has a crap ton of health. As you can see, it has way more than any of my other creatures. And it gives all of us that nice little barrier that you see. Yeah, you want to kill the Minotaur Warrior as quickly as possible because uh, every time you attack it, it gets 20% more attack. So you want to hit it as few times as possible, kind of like that uh, Timeless Master that you saw earlier. Also, the Willow Spirit is annoying, because if you attack it directly, so things like the bleed damage and things like the glaive bouncing onto it don't trigger it, but if you attack it directly and don't kill it, it will actually turn invisible for a, a full round. So it'll take a while before you can attack it again. Alright, we're gonna just cleave that Minotaur there. And now we can pretty much just clear this out fairly easily. Alright, it is mortally wounded, so I should be able to kill it. Nice. There we go. And there's a battle. So that's how the battle system works. Simple, but like many other parts of this game, kind of uh, defyingly so in how the complexity kind of behind the scenes interacts. So we're gonna get some levels here, which is nice. Some of my creatures are leveling up. And... wow. And we get some various resources. So the resources in the game are brimstone, crystal, essence, granite, and then power. And you use those for all sorts of different things. There we go. Oh, hey, thanks for the achievement. Now, it looks like you're gonna get into another battle very shortly. My duty in this room was actually to kill nine of those willow spirits, so... Alright, here we go. Oh, there's a bunch in this one. 
also a creature I haven't seen before. So in this case, I want to try and extract cores from that creature, the one on the top left, the bird looking thing. I've actually not seen that one, so I want to attack it, but I don't want to kill it because kind of like in Pokemon, the lower health it has, the more likely I am to successfully extract a core from it. So let's attack it with a creature that shouldn't kill it. Of course, extracting does take that creature's turn as well, so I don't want to try and extract yet because my Brimsmith is able to kill almost anything in a single hit, so... There we go. Alright, let's make sure it's it's only lightly bruised. Obviously, you can't see a creature's exact health amount, but it gives you a kind of general idea of how healthy they are, so I'm gonna attack it again. It seems to have very high defense and take very little damage. We'll attack it one more time. Hopefully it won't die before I get to try and extract it. Alright, they're going to start attacking us now, which is unfortunate. That Dragon Soldier has the unfortunate effect of reducing temporarily the maximum health of whatever it hits, as you can see. Maximum health by 100, ouch. But definitely a not... Not bad amount. Alright. It is somewhat damaged, I can try and extract. Yep, ooh, I got two. I have a small chance to get two because of the skill I have. There we go. And you can only extract from any single enemy once per battle, so there's no reason for me to extract from anything else because I already have at least three cores of every other creature in this fight. So I'm gonna just keep kind of powering through these guys and see if I can kill them all before they kill me. So the way you lose in this game is actually a little different. Uh, normally you, you can't necessarily die exactly. Um, if all of your creatures are killed, you will be kicked out of the realm and returned back to the castle, and you'll lose a bunch of your power balance. And power balance is kind of a stacking buff effect. Uh, it's expended whenever you go to a new realm in small amounts, it's expended when you flee, it's, it's expended in a large amount, I think 30% when you die. Or lose. And uh, it affects the kind of loot and things like that that you'll be getting, basically the higher your power balance is, it's almost like luck, you'll get more and better things as your balance gets higher. So you want that to be as high as possible. All right, there we go. And um, there is, however, there, there are several options when you actually start a new game, when you start a new character. And a couple of those is a permadeath option, which basically makes it to where, you know, if all your creatures die, then that save file is gone. And there's also another option that uh, could definitely mess with the pacing of the game because it's going to change the creatures you have access to pretty easily, but it makes it to where if a creature dies in battle and isn't resurrected by the end, it actually reincarnates as a completely different random type of creature uh, with a very tiny percentage of the experience the original had. So it's not quite permadeath, but it is sort of a permadeath of that exact creature. So there's some very interesting options that you have when you first start the game that allow you to actually play it quite a bit differently, and that kind of gets onto the main idea. The game is meant to be played your way. Uh, I mentioned before that it doesn't really have much of a story, that is the case. The idea is that you're meant to make your own fun. You're meant to kind of do whatever you want, build up your own army, create your own story, as it were. And, uh... That's good and bad, because it's good for people like me that like variety and really enjoy the idea of just kind of going through and having fun and seeing what cool creatures I can find next and, you know, just kind of experiencing the large amount of content, by the way, that the game has on offer. But for people that enjoy very story-based experiences, this might not be for you, because as far as story goes, it doesn't really... It doesn't have much of a story, per se. Which is unfortunate, but, I mean, that's obviously part of the point they were going for here, so your mileage may vary, but if you're like me and don't really mind, it does offer a huge amount of content, so there are lots of different realms to visit, and of course it's different every time due to the fact that they're randomly generated. Uh, there are a vast number of creatures, I believe over 300 that you can meet and capture, every single one of them by the way, and uh, make your own army. Now, if you'll notice, every creature has its own ability. So every single one has 
a, an effect. So, like I said, the Lich has that blood magic thing. It sacrifices some of its health to gain attack. Uh, let's see, the Bloodhound creates those dire wolves. The Brim Smith gets 200% more attack from its artifact. That's why it's so ridiculously strong, because I equipped it with a, an artifact with a huge amount of attack, so that the it kind of synergizes well with its uh, special ability. The Siren gives us that barrier, which is nice. It's sort of like a 25% extra health barrier. The uh, Fire Wound Angel actually has a 50% chance of burning any enemies it hits for extra damage, and then the Servant Hunter, as I showed you, has a glaive that bounces across three different creatures. And this preservation effect is because of the artifact it's equipped with. So, every single one of the creatures in the game actually has its own unique ability, which is very cool and adds a pretty insane amount of variety to it. Also, you have artifacts, which are just objects that you can equip a creature with. Any given creature can have one artifact, and the way these work is they will give you different stats depending on what type of artifact it is. I have a wizard hat, and uh, it actually has a level, as you can see. It levels up from the creature equipped with it getting kills, and uh, every time it levels up it will get another slot. Now how these work is... Their primary stats are determined by the type of item they are, so the sh sorcery shield gives you sorcery defense, obviously. A sword gives you attack. And every time it levels up, the primary stats will increase by a small amount, making it stronger. The secondary stats are kind of random, and it has a number of slots for these. As you can see, this sword has three slots, because it's level three. And so every time a artifact levels up, it will gain more and more slots, and there's actually a crafting system in the game where you can take different kinds of materials, all of these, as you can see I have a, a very large number of them, to actually uh, enchant a particular item with these effects, and you can have as many of these effects as the object has secondary slots from leveling up. Of course, there are also these legendary materials, which have all kinds of extremely potent effects, but they're very, very rare. And, uh, you can only enchant a... a any artifact with one legendary material, so you can't just stack it up with a bunch of those. But they're very, very strong. There's also a large number of consumables in the game. The consumables work a lot differently. As you may have noticed, there's actually no use item uh, function in the battle, because the consumables are actually used outside of battle, and they tend to give you an effect for the next battle. So there are all kinds of them, from making your creatures have more maximum health, to doing more damage, or having more defense to a certain type of class, to getting you more um, of a certain type of, of resource from the next battle, to giving you more experience, to giving you 100% chance to extract cores, there's all kinds of them, there's these huge numbers. And, uh, what it comes down to is kind of what you're willing to, to do, what you want to do. In this case, I'm trying to do, uh, I'm trying to make a nether egg, which apparently gives me an extremely powerful version of a specific creature. It's a very time-consuming kind of endgame process, and uh, I'm almost there, but it involves you having to create these gems to actually... Uh, ooh, what is that? Create these gems to enchant this orb with that makes an egg. It's, it's really complex, but luckily the game has these things called castle quests, which are kind of like tutorials. And they will actually kind of lead you through the mechanics of the game. And since the game has so many mechanics, and since some of them are very, very different, from what you may expect, I really recommend, at least your first time through the game, turning on those castle quests. Because the the general idea is... it's nice. <laughs> There's a lot of stuff to learn about the game, but it does a good job of teaching it to you. And uh, the creation of a nether egg is definitely... the most... nice. Definitely the most kind of time-consuming and complex of the mechanics I've run into so far, but it does a good job of leading you through step by step and uh, making sure you understand it. The game also has a library, which will tell you you can visit anytime you're, you you want to go back to your castle, and uh, it actually allows you to research the various topics. It tells you about the creature classes. It tells you about nether eggs, and it's kind of 
uh, like a manual almost. There are all kinds of things you can look at in there. And in fact, the librarian herself will allow you to look at all of the status effects to remind yourself what they do, which is really nice because there are eight pages of them, which is just, that's a lot. All right, we're being provoked by this, this annoying wall creature here that that's kind of one of its special abilities. It likes to provoke you and it uh, has a, an effect where it actually doesn't get the negative of uh, defense from provoking, so it's basically a tank. So, kind of uh, what you're looking to do is create a very, a very synergistic uh, party of creatures. Party, uh, creatures which have effects that work together nicely, since every creature has a different uh, special ability along with it. And of course, equipping different creatures with different artifacts that maximize their effectiveness or kind of help to cover some of their weaknesses. Like, for instance, equipping my Lich with a lot of, uh, an artifact which increases its maximum health by a lot is really good, because it uses some of its maximum health to raise its attack. So the more health it has, the longer it can do that, and the more attack it's going to gain from each time it does it. So the synergy there is, of course, to kind of get its health as high as you can. And basically, that's where the meat of the game comes from, is actually finding and summoning different creatures to make a party that you want, and finding and making different artifacts to equip them with. And of course, there's the... you can craft artifacts from a blacksmith, and then craft materials into those artifacts to customize their effects. You can even reforge them and things like that. So, the game is very much player-driven, it's what you want to do with it, and like I said, that's a good and a bad thing, it depends on your stance. For me, I like that, um, but people that are looking for a more directed, uh, kind of linear experience aren't going to really get that here. But I would still recommend to at least try it out, it is not expensive at all. And it has just an absurdly large amount of content to it that really keeps you kind of coming back. It, You know those games, especially in RPGs, where you are kind of given a goal and you you want to keep playing until you reach that specific goal. Like, you want to just beat the boss of this dungeon, or you want to just get to the next town to see what's available, or you want to just level up your creature to this, or one of your characters, to this level to see what new ability they get. Things like that that kind of keep you playing in a specific session. That's basically the entirety of this game. It is entirely based on progression. You're going to want to progress, just make yourself a new progression goal, and then keep going until you, ooh, until you get to that point. So my goal right now is to keep going until I can get these gems enchanted to create a nether egg. That's my current goal. And I also want to keep discovering new creatures and leveling them up. That's my other current goal, is to kind of improve my party because I have some weaknesses in it. So the game is pretty much entirely based on what is that? It's adorable. Is the idea that you are gonna want to... a skeleton sniper. To make your own goals and have the game's very, very in-depth progression kind of carry you through and keep you coming back to it again and again. That's the idea behind it. And in my opinion, it does that very well because there are so many mechanics that are actually in place and so much complexity in place that it, I mean, there really is something to do every time you hop onto it and start playing. There's just a new thing to work towards. The entire game is you working towards your own set goals that you've set yourself. And uh, if that sounds good to you, then I highly recommend it. It's a very unique experience. I like the art style. I think that I just, I like good, well done sprites. And the game definitely has those. It has very well-drawn sprites that use uh, a kind of 16-bit aesthetic that definitely reminds me of things like older Dragon Quest, Dragon Warrior, Megami Tensei, Final Fantasies that have a good amount of detail in the creature sprites that actually make them pretty fun to look at. And since there are so many of them, I'm going to show you more in just a second, it's easy to... Uh, you jerks, kill my bloodhound. It's easy to to be enthralled by them. It's easy to uh, to kind of be carried along by your own progression goals and just see what happens. It's definitely a fun game. Uh, most of the fun, of course, comes from you 
actually setting your own goals. And uh, if that's not, dang it, they're all invisible. If that's not something that you're okay with, well, you know, I mean, I guess uh, it might not be for you, but I think there's enough content here for it to really be worth almost anyone trying. Um, I think the general idea behind it, the idea that you are kind of expected to make your own fun, is something that a lot of games have actually been doing in their own way lately because of, I mean, really the prevalence of Minecraft kind of led to that, right? It, uh, dang it, I didn't mean to do that. The idea that uh, it basically led to the idea that people like to set their own goals and keep themselves coming back. And there have been a lot of games that have tried that and maybe not had enough to actually keep people interested. That people say, you know, there's not enough game here for my money. That's happened a lot recently. This is one of the cases where that's not true at all. There's definitely enough game here for your money. All right, so let's uh, let's see what I get from this. Bunch of stuff. Oh, I still need to kill one more of them. Dang it. All right, well, one more battle. There it is. All right. What is that? Is that a sentient gas mask? I want one. It is a noxious smog. All right, well, let's attack it. Hopefully not kill it. Ooh, mortal blow. Basically a crit. All right, it survived. So I hopefully can try and extract from it. It's somewhat damaged. All right. Uh, let's kill this bloodhound so it doesn't give dire wolves to the other enemy creatures. So it's actually quite strategic in battle because uh, knowing what the special abilities of all the enemy creatures are, and they can also be equipped with artifacts of their own, by the way, something to consider. Hopefully that doesn't kill it. All right, it didn't go. The strategy definitely comes into play and the farther into the realms you go, you can find teleporters and realms and go deeper and uh, just go levels and levels in the harder the enemies get, and sometimes you will encounter nether enemies of your own, which are, you know, very strong, uh, very strong versions of those creatures, and the challenge definitely comes in hoping to maximize the synergy that your, your creatures have with each other and with the artifacts they're equipped with, and of course the spells that you have access to, let's just use one. Holy Explosion. Kaboom. Aw, uh, yeah. Nice, nice spell effects too. Very, very much old school, but well done old school. Not just old school because the creators didn't want to make anything fancier. It's actually really well done and has a lot of thought put into it, in my opinion, the, the graphical style. So I think the strategy, the content, the making your own goals, all of that is something that uh, a lot of people very much enjoy. And uh, if that's you, then this is definitely the game for you. There's a lot here to like. It's imperfect, uh, you know, combat can get repetitive. I don't mind because of just the sheer number of creatures and spells and stuff. So it doesn't necessarily get repetitive quickly, but, and nothing's stopping you from changing up your party very often as well. But, creatures of freaking Phoenix comes back. But, uh, it stayed dead that time, good. But there is one issue that I want to talk about, so, now that this duty is complete, let's see what I get. So, ooh, crap. A bunch of experience, a bunch of royalty points, which is something I'll need to explain now. Ooh, and some nice items. Okay, let's portal out really quick. You can make what's basically a scroll of town portal anywhere. It just takes a little bit of your power balance to use. So, unfortunately, I have had a bug in the game, and it's been annoying. So, to create these gems, basically I have to expend a resource called Essence, which if you can see the five uh, resources down there below the thing that says Save Game, which I'm going to do right now, in order, the one that starts with 55,000, I have uh, Brimstone, Crystal, Essence, Granite, and Power. And Essence is used in making these gems. Now, it takes 1,500 to make a gem, and then 2,500 to enchant a gem. So it's actually, it's pretty draining on your essence, which is why I have so little of it right now. I have to make 15 of these gems in order to make a nether egg. Now, if I go to my items, you can see all the ones I have. The Rapturous Ghoul gems are the ones that I'm, I've been making. So, in your castle, there is this area right here. You go up the floor, go over to here, 
and go into the gym temple. Da, 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 da. And here we are. There is this altar. When I go to this altar, I can make new gems or I can enchant the ones I have. And you have to enchant your gems into specific types, that being, you know, rubies, sapphires, diamonds, emeralds, or topaz. And when you do this... I can't actually do it right now because I don't have enough uh, essence. But when you do this, you will have to kill enemies to further this ritual. As you can see, you can do rituals. And every time you complete a battle, you get some energy towards any of your active rituals. And uh, when the ritual is done, you return to this altar and use it, and it gives you the gem. This has happened to me three times now, where I've went to use this altar after the ritual has been completed, and the game has crashed on me, unfortunately. Now, when I load back up, the ritual is gone, like, as if I completed it, but the gem is not in my inventory, which means I that gem is kind of lost forever, and I've had to create a new one and do the process over. So, the process of making nether eggs is supposed to be time-consuming, of course, which is fine, but this bug has made it even more time-consuming than normal, which is unfortunate. So, that's pretty much the only crash or bug that I've encountered, luckily, and it's happened to me three times in the 15 times I've done it. So, yeah, it's annoying, but hopefully that's something that can be fixed. Unfortunately, I don't really have any specifics on what could cause that. But, yeah, so there's that. Also, there's this. This is how you summon your creatures. So I wanted to show you some of the creatures I have just to show you the uh, variety that's in the game. So every time you get three cores of a creature, you can return here and then spend some of your resources to summon one of them. And as you can see, every single one of these has really nicely done sprites. They have a, a, uh, a class, which, you know, chaos, sorcery, nature, things like that. And they also have a type, so this is a dryad, this is a djinn, this is a diabolic horde type, and those determine different things, like, for instance, this one's special ability increases its uh, defense for every diabolic horde creature that you have with it in your party. So you can make kind of gimmick parties if you want. Of uh, I could make a party of all six of those if I wanted to. Or, you know, you can... You're encouraged to change up your party a lot. And uh, there's even a stable where you can keep all of the creatures you're not using right now, so there's not really a limit, as far as I can tell, to how many you can have. You can only have six in your party, but you can have many, many more than that active. I kind of want a spider occultist. Obviously, that the synergy with that one is getting it some more attack, and then some objects, maybe an artifact that raises its luck a lot. That would be nice. It's a sorcery type, which I don't have very many of. What would it take? Let's see, three of the cores, a bunch of brimstone, a bunch of crystal, and some power. I could do it. Mm, I'll do it. Yay! You can also go to the library to name any of your creatures, which is cool. And that occultist is now in my stable. And then, of course, you have this thing, which allows you to cast some very potent spells that uh, use a lot of your power resource to give you special bonuses and things. Really, there's just so much to do. Uh, it's hard to actually cover it all at first, but basically, you can also talk to any of these people in your, uh, including a cat, in your castle. And, uh, there's also this, the last thing I should probably explain. Construction rituals. So, you can create new rooms onto your castle. This is how I got the goblet that you saw up there, this is how I got the gem temple, the blacksmith, the enchanter, there's also an arena, and there's more. You spend granite and power, and uh, fight enemies to complete the ritual, and you add on new rooms to your your castle. And the new rooms will have new NPCs to talk to, and, you know, the blacksmith, for instance, after you get him, he can forge you new artifacts. The enchanter can actually use the materials you have to craft new effects onto those artifacts, like I showed you. Basically, the game starts off fairly simple, but the longer you go and the more... Uh, the more things you research and build, the more complexity is layered onto what's already there. Uh, there are even new interactable objects within the realms that you'll find depending on the things that you've built. Like piles of gems and these gem boxes can only be found... They can be found in pretty much any realm, but they can only be found once you actually build a gem temple. Every realm has its own different resources it gives out with higher priority. For instance, granite is found in death realms a lot easier, brimstone is found in chaos realms, and uh, there are many different special effects that can happen in battles as well. For instance, sometimes if you're in a nature realm and you you or the enemy group cast a spell, it'll say that it, it breaks off some mushrooms and that party will get poisoned. 
So, really, it's... It's a game that is filled to the absolute brim with content that is meant for you to make your own enjoyment out of, and uh, I think it does a very good job at that. I like the kind of rock, paper, scissors of the creature classes. The best way to think of them is life as white mana for Magic the Gathering, uh, nature as green, death as black, chaos as red, and sorcery as blue. And the way they interact with each other is actually very similar to how those colors interact with each other. I almost wonder if they weren't inspired by that, but I can't really tell. And of course, all of this information can be learned by doing the castle quests and can be referred back to by going up there into the library for some refresher courses. So, yeah, the game is actually huge. It's simple, but the complexity clearly shows itself uh, quite quickly once you start adding more rooms onto your castle and more mechanics are being unlocked. And of course, the idea of constructing your own force of uniquely uh, powerful creatures, each with their own specific abilities and equipping them with their own artifacts to sort of synergize well with each other. That's something that people love a lot. I mean, look at the success of the Shin Megami Tensei games and games like Pokemon. This is exactly that. Uh, it's pretty impressive. I really like it. So check it out on Steam, everyone. It is not an early access. It's a finished product, but it is continually being updated, it seems, and it's had some pretty cool events going on as well. There are like seasonal events that happen that can give you new, uh, I think access to new creatures and things like that. So yeah, there's just a ton to like here. And uh, if this is your thing, I really recommend checking it out. So this has been Cyrilum. And uh, thank you very much for watching everyone. Go on, try it out. It's not expensive and uh, construct your own army of unique creatures. Like I said, I think there are over 300 of them in the game. There's just so much here to, uh, to play through. So thanks for watching everyone and I'll see you next time.